we're really delighted to welcome back to Los Angeles Film Forum, uh, Eric Pleiser. And, uh, uh, he's been making a really tagless array of short and longer work, experimental animation and otherwise. Uh, and we're delighted to host the Los Angeles premiere of his feature film, Apocalypsis, and also the fantastic short film, Land, which we'll start the program with. And at the end, we'll do a Q&A, but to introduce the film tonight, please join me in welcome here. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's good to see familiar faces and new faces here. Um, I'm excited to present this film, which is actually newly finished. Um, uh, what can I say about it? I worked on it the last three years or so. Um, it largely is about my experience living in New York. Um, as you know, some of you know, I'm uh, born here in California, spent most of my life here. And um, I moved to New York in 2010. And a lot of it's uh, about my paranoid feelings living in, in the, the police state of New York, and also uh, a lot of. Um, other different experiences and dreams and travel on the East Coast distilled into this uh, this kind of fever dream of a piece. So uh, hope you like it. If you're here for the animation, which I think a lot of you probably are, the animation kind of builds as the piece goes on. So I don't want you to feel like you're dismayed as <laughs> it starts out. Um, other than that, uh, we can talk after. I don't really have much to say for intro. So thank you so much for being here. That's amazing. Let's talk about land first, briefly. Yeah. And talk, tell us about, about the practice of doing these sort of land animations. Yeah. Um, I'm always inspired by landscapes and like, you know, traveling. But uh, I saw a few little things done in some um, experimental films I saw when I was at color. Because I was also learning about some of like, the movements in the 60s and 70s, like land art and things like that. It just kind of, to me, is very simple uh, to translate that into doing some animation experiments, some formal experiments. So um, I started, you know, largely what's in the film with doing simple patterns with snow, <clears throat> and then I started doing larger forms, which were uh, <clears throat> dangerous, <laughs> especially with snow, because you're outside for so long, and uh, a lot of the things. But it's, it's a pretty uh, difficult manual labor, so I think it's going out. Um, but, uh, and then some of the recent work I've merged doing camera moves, um, <clears throat> timing out different things with moving the land, and also, you know, as, as I've had years of doing it now, uh, calculating for different things with light, also manipulating things in camera while I'm doing the animation, and now adding some post elements by like changing colors and things like that. So it's, uh, it's probably the most exciting thing that I've been doing. And you now I have, you saw a little bit in this last film where I'm bringing life-size elements into it as well. But um, for new work, I'm still keeping it abstract. So I think that's the strongest part of the bringing the figure in. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad people like it. And, uh, it's definitely uh, worth the time. Out of all the other things that are time consuming, I feel like these kind of uh, experiments kind of pay off for other things. You kind of like, mm -hmm. that was worth like a week. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Do they take, so each shot a day? Yeah, about, about a day to do, yeah. Or longer. But I like it. It's it's a meditation for me because so much it's about I'm outside doing it. Uh, of course, I get that kind of rush after it's done. But do I actually enjoy going? You know, being on the elements and actually do it's. I have to stay with the sun or um, time constraint, and uh, that's you have to be completely in the moment. And that's usually what we're kind of after more and more staying in the moment. So it's great. 
So one question I have, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk also about apocalypses, but just to transition, I mean, obviously there's some of them in apocalypses. Yeah. But the notion of having a film that is using this form, or let's say, there's a way thing of just experimental film where it's like, oh, people do that stuff. Oh, and then they put it, and then they borrow it and use it for real in like a narrative feature. And it's like, to me, you know, the short version is the for real. And yeah, in the in the having it be like just <clears throat> assigned the meaning of her visions right. within a, within a narrative form, yeah. like it changes our perception of it, right. and in a way, sort of reduces it, right. but but also makes it accessible in other ways. But sure. I just want to see what your no, thoughts might be on that. I don't really draw like clear divisions between my feature shorts paintings, like other other experiments to me, I just, they're all materials that I can use. And since I'm, you know, the, the owner of them, I can do as I will, basically with them. And uh, some people get upset or like, oh, you, I saw that in several films or something. It's like, to me, it's just a, a continuum. Um, a lot of times I need motivation, like, okay, I'm working on this feature, but I also know I'm going to be using this land animation for the short film, which is what I really care about. Um, but also, it, it serves a function uh, for the feature film. But um, yeah, I like I work on multiple things at once uh, to keep myself motivated. So um, that's just my own idiosyncratic way of working. But um, sometimes uh, it's hard for me to take a step back and be like, you know. I just have people engaging with this, but uh, yeah, if you if you watch all of my work together, like I had a retrospective last year, you see there's certain shots that are in multiple films, and to me, like I said, it's just a weaving. But um, I can understand traditionally, it's a no-no. Um, so then, how did bit more? You, you talked a bit about your uh, whatever disenchantment or paranoia of New York and how that sort of led to the things you thought around for uh, apocalypses, but what did some of the more specific uh, starting points or for your for the story for the narrative? Uh, yeah, I had like I always have early drawings and like, dreams or like very loose, real potent abstract ideas going into a project and it kind of reveals itself. But um, I wanted to make a character that was definitely living, uh, doing things to help people outside of herself and like living for uh, the next life. And also having a, a friend who was more, is as well trying to help people but uh, radically engaged in another sphere that was kind of contrary to hers and having that, I just think about certain friendships I have where we believe completely different things but we have so much in common It's such a great friendship. And um, how that happens a lot in life, and also it's what's needed for us to, as a whole to get along with all these divergent views people have. So I thought that would be interesting as like a nucleus of a story. But then, yeah, like moving to New York, uh, especially with a lot was going on with um, right away moving with Occupy, and then with a lot of the terrible police uh, brutality and murders and protests going on. There's, also with like the crackdown with the drones and helicopters and everything where I was living in the Lower Side. Just, I, I'm already, you know, an imaginative person. So to have this cacophony always going on and not being able to sleep and things like that, it just kind of like set my mind on fire. And I was like, I have to incorporate this into my work. Um, and uh, then as the years went on, when my paranoia kind of died down, I was like, Things are, they, things are less extreme, or am I just becoming more jaded and like, used to the surveillance state? Mm -hmm. And um, it's like, why am I not afraid anymore? <clears throat> and, and that kind of made me unsettled in itself. So uh, whenever there's things like this going on, so I try to put it into uh, my work. But um, now, coming over the film Apocalypse, is like, uh, as of the last month or so, it's, it's kind of eerie. Um, <laughs> Success, it's, it's too prescient. Yeah. Um, so, why the Revelation? The Revelation oh, I, of the Primer. I love the book of Revelations, especially, um, I'm a big fan of William Blake. He uh, 
to Dante's Inferno and the Book of Revelations and a lot of his other work has probably been extremely influential to me. And then just the book itself is so visual and I love taking it literally, you know, like these dragons mm. and these beasts and it is throughout like culture. Um, I mean, people never read the book, but it's certainly like in the lexicon and like the unconscious. So I just wanted to go for it uh, and just, you know, take it at face value. Um, you know, it's not like, it's just my personal impression of it. Like I said, I could work on this for years more because it's such a dense book, but uh, I did kind of the Cliff Notes version of it, um, chapter by chapter. And uh, I'm a big fan of like Ray, Ray Harryhausen and Schwankmeyer and people like that who make monsters and beasties and things like that. And so um, maybe it's just like a natural fit for me. Uh, also, I love apocalyptic uh, tales because we live in that, that world now, it's, it's a reality. And um, there's always like doom hanging over us. But also, I wanted to make kind of a, an optimistic apocalyptic tale. And again, trying to being a new father and thinking about what kind of future my son might have and things like that, it's just scary. So um, I wanted to try to digest all of these elements that are floating around in like, our consciousness and uh, see, see what came out very much. Your models uh, the, for the animations, like how big are they? So, I uh, like the angels, the like, like chickens, my wife calls them. Um, they're like three feet or so. Um, the drag, like the seven hundred, seven hundred dragons, about two feet. They're, 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 you can see on my Instagrams, uh, kind of some scaled things, but uh, yeah, they're fairly large. Um, some of the angels were a little smaller, but everything is about two to three feet. And then there's some like six foot, um, you know abstract forms that I move and things like that. Um, there's a few things in there that I'm going to do in the future where it's like a life-size alien looking creature and then I animated the ground along with it moving and it was up on this giant rock and did camera moves which is exciting to me. But um, I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. But I've made, I have no idea, but I made at least 50 or so puppets for this one. Sometimes you see animated films and it's like the same character. Well, with Revelation, there's all these different things popping up. So I have to make this, I have to make that. But uh, that's my favorite part, just like putting on a film or record or something and just making stuff over there. It's wonderful. And your hands get cut off and things like that. But, um, In the back there? Who did all the sand raking? The sand raking? All the shapes and the Yeah, that was hard. I like a hoe and uh, <laughs> some shovels and some other like uh, equipment. Um, where I live now in Sudan, there's a lot of like old nautical things. So I just find like weird dump yards and on low tide you find weird scraps and things. I just take them. This is like my mm -hmm. set of tools <laughs> to make. Uh, it was yeah, very hard work. It's like to me, it's like mowing the lawn or doing. Reminding me of doing yard work as a kid, <laughs> doing some of the animation, just really work up a sweat. Just completely exhausted by the end. Yeah, could you explain a little bit the relationship with like Japan and uh, maybe like the, the overseeing angel over the girl while she was trying to Sure. Um, well, I was in the Hiroshima International Festival in 2012, and that's when the ideas for this film were just beginning there. and. Um, I was so inspired by all the films, but especially being in Hiroshima and going to like the site where like the school children were killed and some uh, other types there made me thinking about um, massive cataclysm and just the the past history of war and things like that, just awful, atrocious things that have happened. And um, I was like, yeah, I'd like to somehow engage with this like in my next film and comment on that. Um, also, uh, I wanted to, I've always been inspired by Japanese uh, culture and art, and I wanted to do something, but not necessarily like a folk tale or something like that, but I knew when I was writing the script that that was going to have some large element. I didn't really know how. And then um, I originally wrote like, I wanted the lead to be 
the Japanese al albino girl, and then I did this casting call, and it's an interesting casting call. Some people like <laughs> dress up in wigs and everything. It's like, oh, you don't have to really. It's just kind of a loose description, but um, yeah, but it didn't work out that way. And just, uh, I don't know, I just like to stay true to the original ideas, even if I don't really know the intellectual reason behind them, but I just I kept that. And then to me, to tie in um, this desire to help people, but then realize that she's probably, uh, you know, she's actually truly needed in New York, helping Michael, who's trying to do this kind of DIY terrorist attack. and. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes we, we see different cataclysms and things like that going on in the world. I'm like, oh, we, maybe I can go and help. But um, then you have to ask yourself, like, what are you really doing when you're living? And, like, how are you affecting the sphere within your proximity? So I was just thinking about a lot of those different things. There's actually, your film has this really incredible sort of list of unheralded places sort of on the fringes of New York City and right. so forth, like yeah. an incredible sort of document of these other places you've been explored that mm -hmm. no one ever, that most people never really right. hear about or mm -hmm. visit. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious about also about your finding these places or seeking them out and then knowing that and then figuring out ways to, to be in them. No, it's, it's very astute you said that. I'm glad you asked me that. But, um, I'm like a big believer in psychogeography and certain areas that may just seem mundane, but I triggered something psychically or emotionally in me that I pinpoint to a certain part of the script that I'm writing. Also, a lot of times you see it's like New York City and uh, it's like the cliche things you think of or whatnot, but actually living there, you know, wherever you live, you can have your secret little spots, that, little nooks that you like and things like that that mean something to you. And then I try to put that in my work to keep myself engaged while I'm actually doing it. But also, if somebody was into this film, they could go on a little Easter egg hunt mm -hmm. and try to figure out what it is. But yeah, I lived on like East 2nd Street between BNC and like the Lower East Side, East Village border. Um, and so uh, I got really engaged in the history of like where I used to live. It used to be like, you know, fires all the time. This is where you went to like score your smack and, you know, there's, it's, but it was like, it hasn't really changed because my wife just came out of bodega and someone blew crack smoke into her face type thing. You know, it's like, it, it was, there's it, like gentrification going on with some artists there, but also like it's the place still where you go to, you know, get like the hard drugs. So it has this long history. So um, just that mixture of elements in that little pocket of New York City and all areas are very distinct into themselves. So, um, that's why it's it's uh, pretty incredible just to go back there and to pick up on these feelings in certain areas that may mean something to somebody else. But you know, um, we were just visiting our uh, family home. And, like this one area of the street, just a mundane street light. For some reason, like I dream about it, and it, something triggers me when, in a good way when I'm there, and I, I don't know why. So. It could be something in the past that used to be there, or just something in the ether. But just talk a bit about, and if you want to interject as well, so how does the sound editing and music work oh, yeah. with you and your brother? Uh, well, the scores are like, beautiful, by the way. Yeah, Thanks. I love working with my brother, and he's just getting better over time, but uh, <laughs> usually, He's pretty involved with the films as I'm making them, which he was certainly involved in this thing too, but he's been doing more of his own composition. He did a symphony and we, we kind of went off on our own for a little bit before we came back together for this film. But for this one, um, he was had some distance to it. So, uh, you know, I'm sure he could speak a lot more to it, but I just feel like he, like I've said over and over, we have such a close relationship with his brother. So he understands very intuitively, like, how I'm feeling, why I'm making the work, what I want it to be, but it's also very um, somewhat indifferent to giving him specific directions, you know, except for some parts. And um, so I just let him come to the film with, with what he has. And also, I knew because he's been working at the Criterion Collection for such a long time that um, he's kind of mastered a lot of uh, technical things. Uh, he's like, he knows more about video things than I do. So, um, He's, he's gained in wisdom about a lot of those other elements, but also retained 
his vision with his music. And um, for this one, I was like, this is somewhat of a genre mystery thriller piece. I know you usually do, you know, kind of like offbeat fantasies or, you know, something like that. So I was interested to see what he would do. And um, he did a lot of or orchestral work, but the very first stuff he sent me was a lot of synth stuff that's mostly in the film. And I, he's like, oh, I just did this like in a night. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. And he's like, no, let's go do the stuff, uh, or orchestral stuff that I spent a lot of time on. I was like, mm, maybe here and there, but the stuff he did kind of without thinking is perfect. So mm. um, I don't really know what was going to happen when I tried to animate the Book of Revelation. It's a pretty bizarre um, and mysterious book. But uh, I did see some type of like a narrative uh, arc through it, which I think is interesting. It's basically like there's calamity, but there's always kind of a regeneration that happens. And um, to me, that's like what Christ left was, like, the calamity and the regeneration. And uh, also just for anything in our lives that seemed like like loss and destruction, things like that, things that like completely ruin us and make us you know, hopeless or suicidal, but um, usually there seems to be some type of eventually, you know, through that catastrophe, some type of enrichment that happens in the soil of like our destruction where plants can grow and new opportunities spring up. So um, I actually see Revelation as a very hopeful uh, book and also just things in the future that we're going to face, even though I think there'll be like some, almost a mass extinction, I do think there's, cause, because there's creativity and there's people who, like ch new children being born who have fresh ideas that'll mm. somehow bring people through. I think that's happened a lot where there's been like almost an annihilation of the animals and humans, like mass extinctions, but then somehow, you know, life continues on. So. And I think that's beautiful, and that should always help us through like the dark moments. But um, yeah, I mean, I've had my own like spiritual journey making the film, and it's not complete. So that's kind of why I make films, but also just to get people's feedback. And um, especially when I engage with a Christian subject matter and things like that, um, where a lot of times now that's somehow correlated to like conservatism or extremism, things like that. Like, I'm not coming from that angle at all. I'm coming from like an art historical angle. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's just good. That, it's a good thing now I've kind of seen people tell me there's people like me doing that. Because I'm not here to judge anybody or tell them that they're going to hell or that they're not the, the chosen people or something like that. And I think people need to hear that because um, there's a lot of great things to Christian history. And uh, just, uh, we're all spiritual beings and should all be respected. Are you able to uh, talk about, it's something we're to articulate yet, just the interest for the, of the albino mm -hmm. uh, you position oh, yeah. or yeah. for metaphor? Or what's, mm -hmm. tell us about that. Um, I, I like British and <laughs> albinism or any type of uh, animal that has some type of mutation. <laughs> I can't really just describe that, but I think I'm really interested in camouflage and things like that in nature. Like, I'm a big Optify fan, things that have, uh, in nature, there's some type of anomaly that, you know, should be kind of, like, cut out of the food chain, you know, just through, um, you know, various factors. But uh, also it kind of represents to me, like, rarity in the world, like somebody's trying to go against, um, common societal accepted norms and also represent kind of um, how she's vulnerable to mm -hmm. this kind of a aggressive world that's attacking her and targeting her. So all those things are in there, but there's al there's albinos in a lot of my work and, um, and, and clowns and other things like that. Are just, <laughs> well, it's uh, your, the production company as well, right? Yeah. I assume yeah. that's not that well, ongoing that's, that's production company name, not just yeah. this one. Yeah. yeah. That's based off St. Eustace, if you know that story of that saint, but, um... Saint, I'm sorry. St. Eustace, he, you've seen the Museum of Dress Technology, you guys been there before? Yeah. Yeah, you see the Kirchner, he had this thing where basically 
this Roman general saw the crucifix and probably speaking to him in the, over the deer's antlers. And um, then he was killed uh, by the same people he was, well, he's, he's killed for being a Christian after that. So I think a lot of those saint tales and miraculous tales of old are interesting to me. And, um, but the outline of thing people ask me about that is like, I don't really know. I have a lot of certain like preoccupations that are interesting to me because I don't know why I'm so obsessed with them. But uh, yeah, I mean, I really don't like giving clear cut answers to a lot I, of different things. Well, I wouldn't expect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think what the, there are elements that you could tell right. us about it. All right, we have to clear out, set a clock. Wonderful. But I want to thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you.